Notre Dame opens up spring practice in a couple of days, and we'll get our first look at some key position battles on offense. Is Tyler Buckner going to give Sam Hartman a run for his money to be the starting quarterback? Plus, there's two open positions up for grabs on the offensive line. Who's going to win out? All that and more on this edition of Locked On Irish. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Irish. It is Monday, March 20th, and thank you for getting your week started with us and making this your first listen of the day. I hope you guys had a great St. Patrick's Day weekend and the first weekend of March Madness. Personally, I think I watched like 40 hours of college basketball over the weekend, and I enjoyed every second of it, and I hope you did as well. As a reminder, this show is free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts, so whether you're watching or listening, please take a moment to hit that subscribe button. If you're listening to the pod, please rate and review the show as well. We're trying to get that rating back to five stars, so I'd greatly appreciate it if you did that. My name is Tyler Wojcik and I'm the host. I've been a huge Notre Dame fan for my entire life. I graduated from the university in 2018 and I've been podcasting about the football team since the 2020 season. I'm also a producer for the college football talent at Fox Sports in LA. The Irish open up spring ball on Wednesday, March 22nd, and I'm so excited to see the 2023 Fighting Irish football team in action for the first time this year. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at the top position battles on offense that will begin to get sorted out over the course of the next month. We'll look at the top position battles on defense in tomorrow's episode, but for today, we're going to focus on the offense, and then we'll wrap things up with some shout-outs and closeouts from the weekend. All right, so on offense, we got to start with the quarterbacks, right? Now, last year at this time, we were all super excited to see Tyler Buckner as the clear QB1. I know Notre Dame portrayed it as a uh, as a battle between Buckner and Drew Pine, but like, come on. Then Buckner's shoulder gets crushed in week two against Marshall. He misses the rest of the regular season. Then Notre Dame went out and got the top quarterback in the transfer portal. So here we are. We got a quarterback competition again. So let's break it down. Is this competition similar to last year's competition in that it's not really a competition? I don't think that's the case. And look, we all assume that Sam Hartman is the best quarterback on the field. His resume certainly backs that up, and he's already shown us that he's one of the most talented quarterbacks in all of college football. So let's look at it by the numbers. Sam Hartman comes into Notre Dame with 45 career starts under his belt, and during that time, he's thrown for a 59% career completion percentage on nearly 1,600 attempts. So he's thrown the ball a lot. He's the ACC career leader in touchdown passes with 110 compared to 41 interceptions, which turns out to a 2.68 touchdown to interception ratio. He's thrown for nearly 13,000 passing yards, and he's also a threat on the ground. I don't really think that gets talked about enough. For his career, he's ran for 856 rushing yards, which includes the the yards lost via sack. So... That happened to him a lot at Wake Forest, by the way. He's been sacked 105 times in his career, but he has 17 rushing touchdowns. And even though he's not nearly the runner that Buckner is, defenses definitely have to prepare for Hartman's escapability and his threat in the read option, the RPO situations. Now, as for Buckner, he's only started three games in his career. He started the first two games the last season, obviously. Both of them were losses, but he was able to return from his shoulder injury in time for the ball game and get his first career win. He's only thrown 118 passes in his career for six touchdowns and eight interceptions. And Buckner has been much more effective on the ground. We all know that. He's already logged 459 rushing yards and seven touchdowns on 82 attempts, which averages out to 5.6 yards per carry. Again, that number would be even higher if you take out the sacks. So when you look at it by the numbers, like, it's a no-brainer. And maybe it will be. You know, there's a chance that Harmon steps in, he takes immediate control of the job for the jump, and he's clearly the starter by the end of April. I'm really curious to see how Notre Dame approaches this situation because how Notre Dame handles this quarterback competition over the course of the next month could have long-lasting implications that affect the program for the next several years. So let me explain what I mean by that. Unlike last year, Notre Dame has plans for Buckner to be the starting quarterback eventually. I don't think that was ever the case with Drew Pine. They needed Pine on the team as the backup, but I don't think he was ever in the plans to be the starting quarterback for the full season. Now, obviously, things didn't turn out that way. Buckner gets hurt, he comes in, he plays a full season. But if it were up to Notre Dame, if you asked Tommy Reese and Marcus Freeman behind closed doors and they knew it would never get out, if they said, hey, do you ever think Drew Pine is going to be a starting quarterback at Notre Dame at the time, I think they probably would have said no. That's not the case with Buckner here because – Hartman's only going to be at Notre Dame for one year, and then next year, who's the favorite to be the starting quarterback? It's Tyler Buckner in his senior season. So even if Hartman wins the job, Notre Dame certainly needs Buckner around this year as the backup, and then next year, he again, he'd be the favorite to be the starting quarterback. So it's very, very important that Buckner stays around and doesn't transfer. Here's the thing with Buckner. 
okay? He's fully healthy now, which is important. Last year, he, you know, he had that injury in spring where I think he, like, tripped over some steps and wasn't able to play in the spring game. But right now, he's fully healthy as far as we know. And I'm curious to see... How much did he learn from sitting in the booth throughout last season with Tommy Reese and other members of the Notre Dame offensive staff there? Because he wasn't on the sideline. He made the choice to go up in the booth. And I think that's a very valuable experience. Obviously not nearly as valuable as being on the field and playing on Saturdays. But look, he made the best out of a bad situation, I think, by going into the booth. I think he learned a lot about how the game is called, how the coaches are seeing it from up top. And now he's able to understand the offense a little bit better, see things a little bit differently than he did last season. And I think that experience will help him in spring practice. Sam Hartman has only been on campus for three months. Buckner's been around for nearly or already two years. And even though Notre Dame has a new offensive coordinator in Jared Parker, I think we all expect there to be a lot of similarities between Jared Parker's offense and what Tommy Reese like to do, at least at this stage of the year. Like, I don't think we're going to see mass changes in the Notre Dame offensive scheme until the fall, if we ever see it at all. I think they're like-minded. And let me be clear. I believe that Sam Hartman will end up being the starting quarterback for Notre Dame. But everyone from the fans to the coaches should want Buckner to give a Hartman or to give Hartman a real run for the job because it makes Hartman better, it makes the entire room better, and it makes the team better. And look, I don't think Tyler Buckner is going to transfer, okay? But he might because being a quarterback now in college football, it's like a revolving door. That's how quarterback rooms are at this point. And if it's a situation where Notre Dame comes out, Sam Hartman is getting all the first team reps, Tyler Buckner isn't even given a fair shot. If that rubs him the wrong way enough to look elsewhere, then he might. I'm not saying he won't. I don't know. Personally, I don't think he will. He seems very committed to Notre Dame. Hell, his sister just committed to play soccer at Notre Dame a couple months back. So clearly they're very into Notre Dame, which is great. You know, there's plenty of reasons to be into Notre Dame, despite if, if you're not playing or if you're not getting a ton of playing time on Saturdays. But they got to give Buckner a real shot at the job. One, because I think he deserves it. And two, they need to make sure that Tyler Buckner is fully engaged at the position and is competing not only throughout the spring, but into the summer and throughout the fall. Because we Notre Dame fans know all it takes is one play and then your backup is out there and all of a sudden the whole season is kind of down the drain. I know that's kind of rude to Drew Pine. And look, I, I, we all saw what happened last year when Buckner went down. Drew Pine is a tough dude. I respect everything he did for Notre Dame and the university. But there was a very clear drop off in talent and ability from Buckner to Pine uh, once Pine became the starting quarterback. I don't think that there's as severe of a gap between Hartman and Buckner, but if Buckner sticks around, he sticks out one more year, okay, I think he's going to be in prime position to be the starting quarterback next year. And there's probably a lot he can learn from Hartman. And I know it's tough to ask a guy, especially one like Buckner who's – dealt with some injuries. He missed all last season when he thought for sure he was going to be the starter throughout the year. Like, that's really tough to say, hey, man, stick around one more year. But I guess on the counter to that, if you're Buckner and he's looking to transfer, like, I'm not saying he's not a super appealing job. Like, teams would certainly take him. But how many top programs are still in need of a quarterback at this point? Like, it's not like Tyler Buckner is just going to transfer to another top program and walk into the starting job, at least not at this point in the summer, which he would theoretically be doing if he ultimately decided to transfer at that point. So, look, I don't know. I I think I'm pretty confident that Sam Hartman is going to win the starting job. I think Buckner is going to be the backup. But Notre Dame's approach to the situation is going to be pivotal to how this season turns out and also next season in beyond because I think the best best case scenario for Notre Dame is that Hartman's Hartman wins a job Buckner sticks around for one more year which I think he will and hopefully Notre Dame is able to keep the rest of their guys like Minchie and Jelly heading into the summer and that honestly could be determined by what happens during the next few weeks Kenny Minchie comes in with a little bit more I guess uh recruiting hype than Steve Angeli but again Steve Angeli's been around for a year and as we know with the Notre Dame quarterback situation it rarely works out how you plan it I mean there was a point in time where Deshaun Kaiser said he was considering quitting playing football entirely just switching to baseball then he becomes a starter 2015 because Malik Zaire goes down and the rest is history right like he gets drafted by the Browns in the second round later on like things can change at a moment's notice and the the really all you could do if you're Notre Dame is try to just stockpile that room with as much talent as humanly possible let the best man win and I think the team will be better off in that case all right coming up next we're going to look at the two open spots in the offensive line will Rocco Spindler one of the top recruits in the class of 2021 finally emerge and start a guard for the Irish that's coming up next on Locked On Irish but before we get 
to that, let's talk about Built Bar. The Built March Madness bracket is here, and we know you have a favorite bar or puff, and now's your time to make it count. Go to BuiltMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. You know I'll be voting for the Brownie Batter Puff Bar, and if you want your team to win, then you'll be voting for that bar too. Support your team, support your bar or puff, and when you vote for your favorite bar or puff, you'll be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky Locked On listeners will get a free box of Built. Not only that, but one Locked On fan will win a 12-month subscription of Built to have Built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. You got to try Built, the best protein bar ever. Seriously, they're so amazing, you won't think they're good for you. And what makes Built Bars or Puffs so good? Well, for starters, they're high in protein, low in sugar, and covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. So run to BuiltMarchMadness.com right now to vote for your favorite bar or puff and pick up a box while you're there. You can vote every day in March, so hop in and support your pick today. Thanks again for making Lockdown Irish your first listen of the day. Remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. We're looking at the top position battles on offense today ahead of spring practice. And tomorrow we'll flip to the defensive side of the ball and break down the top position battles on Al Golden's defense. Okay. Enough talk about the pretty boy position. Let's take a look at the hog mollies up front, and I want to know who's going to emerge to try and take control of the starting guard position. So last year, Notre Dame had a fifth-year senior captain in Jarrett Patterson at left guard and six-year senior Josh Lugg at right guard. It's pretty rare that you have that combination of experience and talent, and that's what Notre Dame is going to have to replace in 2023. Honestly, it might be completely unheard of because how many times has there been a six-year senior in college football? Pre-COVID, not very many. So we all know who's going to be lining up at the tackle positions. Joe Alt and Blake Fisher make up for probably the best offensive tackle tandem in all of college football. Alt was the first team All-American last season, and I think Blake Fisher could become an All-American this season because we know he's got all the tools. He's absolutely massive. He started at left tackle as a true freshman at Notre Dame, so he was actually better than Alt early on in his career before he got injured, and he missed the rest of the regular season in 2021 after he got hurt in the season opener against Florida State. But this year, he's not coming off a season-ending injury. I think he's in prime position to have a great, great year for the Irish at right tackle. Fifth-year senior Zeke Carell is... He has firm control over the starting center position, in my opinion. He bounced back strong last year after a pretty tough season in 2021 when he was trying a new position at left guard. But it's worth a reminder that Carell was so good in spring practice last year that he pretty much forced his way onto the field, even if it meant moving Jarrett Patterson from center to left guard, which was not his natural position. Hell, Jarrett Patterson, part of the reason why he came back was to beat one of the best centers in college football and improve his draft stock. I think he actually improved his draft stock by showing that he can play multiple positions at left guard and across the offensive line. But still, it was pretty impressive that Carell forced him to do that in the first place because he was clearly one of the five best offensive linemen last season. So the three of them combined, Alt, Fisher, and Carell, have 57 career starts. Alt has 21, Fisher has 15, and Carell also has 21. Notre Dame has a new offensive line coach at Joe Rudolph, so this experience is very important. And he's already gone on record saying he wants the five best offensive linemen on the field. Not the five best at their positions, the five best of that entire room. That could impact who lines up where, but for now I think the tackles and setter position are set. So who's in the running to start at guard? In one corner, you've got 50-year senior Andrew Kristoffich. He's the most experienced of the group. Kristoffich started the last seven games of 2021, and he helped steady a unit that was absolutely abysmal during the first half of that year. I mean, we all remember it. It was really bad watching that group, and it was so foreign, right? Like, no name's the offensive line. You, how the hell are they this bad? Well, they were, but then Kristoffich came in, and then he actually helped steady that group a little bit. Uh, he wasn't like an All-American, but he stayed there, and he started the rest of the season, which I think is very important. He also got a start in the season opener against Ohio State uh, last season, because Jarrett Patterson was sidelined with a foot injury. Once Patterson was healthy, Kristoffich was no longer a starter. But still, I, he was the sixth man off the bench. Um, and I think that's important to think about as we look ahead to this season. Now, based on some of the reporting that's out there, it didn't sound like Harry Heastan was a huge fan of Kristoffich's game. Now, I don't know all the details, obviously. He just didn't have a ton of great things to say about his game. It wasn't that he was bashing him either. Again, he just he's just kind of there, I guess, to Harry Eastan. But he doesn't, or Kristoffich doesn't have to worry about that anymore because he stands gone. He can make a great first impression this spring with the new coach, and that could help propel him into the starting role. In another corner, you've got redshirt sophomore Rocco Spindler. Spindler was the second highest rated recruit in Notre Dame's class of 2021 behind Blake Fisher, but he just hasn't really been able to crack the rotation in his first two years. He did appear in every game last season on the PAT and field goal unit, so 
I mean, he's at least done that. He's been on the field, but he still hasn't done anything noteworthy for the offense. And I know a lot of fans have been clamoring for Spindler, and I get it. Like, he was a big commitment at the time, came late in the game, and he picked Notre Dame over in-state Michigan, which made him a fan favorite before he even stepped foot on campus. So, look, this is a really important next few weeks for Spindler in his career. Like, I think he gets a pass for his first two years because I think that's actually the standard with most offensive linemen um, at most programs, but especially at Notre Dame, where they recruit top offensive linemen year in and year out. It's really hard for a true freshman, to, or even a true sophomore, really, a redshirt freshman, to crack the rotation on the offensive line because guys are there's a lot of older guys in front of them who are also top recruits. Now, Alton Fisher, they were so good that they kind of ruined it for the rest of recruits because now that's kind of like the expectation, but it's it shouldn't be. That's the exception, not the norm. Spindler's starting with a clean slate here. He's got two full years under his belt now. So he's been around long enough that if he's going to be the player we all thought he could be, we should at least start seeing signs of it now. I'm not saying he's got to lock up the starting job in the spring, but he needs to at least be in the mix if he's going to be around uh, at Notre Dame for much longer. Because if guys, younger guys, like one I'm about to talk about, Billy Shroud, keep passing him up, keep passing him up, Spindler might look around and and try to transfer elsewhere. Look, it happens. I don't think it will, at least not right now, because I think he has a great opportunity in front of him this spring to really make a name for himself with this new offensive line coach um, and make some serious headway into cracking the rotation. Now, as for Billy Stroud, the redshirt freshman was actually recruited by Joe Rudolph to play at Wisconsin when Rudolph was still coaching there. Uh, Shrouth is from Campbellsport, Wisconsin, and Shrouth has been on record saying that Rudolph recruited him really hard, and they had a great connection during that process, and it was actually really difficult for him to turn down Wisconsin and turn down Joe Rudolph. So now, fate has it, and now they get to work together at Notre Dame, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Shrouth has a leg up on everyone else going into the spring because of that prior connection. As a recruit, Shrouth was the number 125 player nationally in the class of 2022, and he was number three at the guard position, according to 24-7. Now, going into last season, Shrouth was dealing with an injury uh, and did see the field much. And again, that's pretty normal for a true freshman on the offensive line. Hell, even Quentin Nelson, one of, if not the best Notre Dame offensive linemen in the past decade, he redshirted his freshman season. So there was a lot of hype around Shrouthens. So he was a late commit to Notre Dame, but that was amplified even more when Howard Cross raved about Billy Strouth during Gator Bowl practice. When Cross was asked which young lineman stir- stood out during the bowl prep, Cross said, quote, Billy, 100% Billy. You ask anybody on the offensive line who they think is going to be a good player out of this class, it's Billy. He's just strong, extremely fast, and his hands like I've never seen. He knows what he's doing. The hands that he has is crazy, end quote. I mean, Damn, (laughs) like it's really high praise coming from anyone, let alone the guy who's going against him every single day in practice. And even more impressive coming from a guy who Al Golden referred to as fast hands Howard. Like that's that's serious right there. So we'll see what happens with Billy Shroud. Now, Pat Coogan and Michael Carmody are also two more names you need to keep an eye on because they're in the mix as well. Kuga is going to be a redshirt sophomore, and he hasn't really seen the field at all much in his career. He got his first game action in last season's blowout win against Boston College, despite being the number two center on the depth chart for most of last season. But like, as we know, the depth chart handed out to the media is more of a formality than anything else. Like, I don't really put too much stock into it because I feel like if Z Corral did get hurt, Patterson would probably move over to center and then Christoffer should play at guard. So even though that Coogan was on the two deep, he really wasn't the next guy in at that position. Now, Michael Carmody is another interesting one because he's going to be a redshirt junior this season. So he's been around the program for a long time, but he hasn't really found his footing on the field yet. If you remember, Carmody started two games in 2021 at left tackle when he was filling in for Blake Fisher, who went down with a knee injury in the season opener that sidelined him for the rest of the regular season. He was kind of rotating with Tosh Baker. Neither of them could assert themselves and and maintain that starting job. But Carmody got his first start against Toledo and did okay. He gave up one sack, but not too bad. But he really struggled against Cincinnati. But then again, like the whole offensive line really struggled in that game because... Like, like it or not, Cincinnati just had better players than Notre Dame, at least on their defense compared to Notre Dame's offense at the time. He gave up another sack, and uh, Carmody was just getting blown off the ball the entire game. Then Joe Alt replaced him the following game against Virginia Tech, and <laughs> that was all she wrote for the left tackle position at Notre Dame until Alt left. Like, Alt wasn't coming off the field after that game. But again, that was that left tackle. Now it looks like Carmody's more suited to, to playing guard, And even though he only got action in one game uh, of all of last season in that blowout against Boston College, he's got another opportunity this spring to maybe make some headway at that guard position. So what we're looking at here is five players competing for two spots. Andrew Kostovich and Michael Carmody are the most experienced of the group. 
Rocco Spindler and Billy Shrouth probably have the most talent, or at least raw ability. And then there's the mostly unknown in Pat Coogan. I think experience will certainly play a role in this competition, but it won't be everything. Like I said earlier, Rudolph is going to play the five best offensive linemen, and this spring is the perfect time to get those inexperienced guys some reps so they can work out the kinks now in March as opposed to on the field on Saturdays in the fall. I think Kristofic is the safest bet to start. Given the fact that he's a fifth-year senior, he was a pretty productive player when, he was, when he's been on the field. Um, he was also the first guy off the bench last season when Jarrett Patterson was out, which speaks to where his game was. Uh, compared to everyone else at the time. And even though we don't see it on Saturdays, or we even though we haven't seen it on Saturdays, I believe he probably improved his game a lot in his one year under Harry Heastand. As for the other guard spot, I think it's going to be Bailey Shrouth, and I think he's going to really solidify himself this spring. We already know that Joe Rudolph thinks highly of him, and I am putting a ton of stock into what Howard Cross said about him as well. Because when you consider his recruiting pedigree and the reports on him that are out there, you could tell this dude is supremely talented and all business. And there's one other thing that comes to mind when I think about Billy Shrouth, right? Because a lot of this has to do with projections and sort of like what we've heard in the past. There's also this component. On the day Marcus Freeman was officially announced as the head coach in Notre Dame, Tommy Reese and Marcus Freeman went directly to Billy's house after the press conference on a private jet. Shrouth was still uncommitted at the time. It was a two-horse race between Notre Dame and in-state Wisconsin. But I think that tells you just how important they believed him to be. And I think we're going to find out why in the spring and then into the fall. So look, that's how I see it now before spring practice starts. But obviously, there's a lot that's going to happen between now and when the actual season starts in late August. But that being said, I think we're going to learn a lot about these position battles over the course of the next four to five weeks and what the offense is going to look like when the Irish take the field in Ireland to start the season. Okay, coming up next, we'll finish out with some shout outs and closeouts from the weekend, including a huge win from the Fighting Irish women's basketball team. So stay tuned for that. But first, I want to tell you about FanDuel. The tournament is heating up, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one. $1,000, that's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to points scored and threes made. Tonight, I'm taking the Rockets to cover at home against the Warriors. I know the Rockets are terrible, but they're getting 9.5 points at home, and the Warriors just they just can't win on the road. I don't get it, but they just can't. This probably sounds crazy, and it might be a vintage hold-on-to-your-butts game. Shout-out to Scott Van Pelt. But I like the Rockets tonight. FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss a chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, let's wrap it up with some shout outs and closeouts from the weekend. And let's talk about the Notre Dame women's basketball team. Neil Ivy squad is headed to the Sweet 16 after they knocked off the 11 seed Mississippi State Bulldogs 53 to 48 on Sunday night in Purcell Pavilion. The Irish cruised past 14 seed Southern Utah in the first round, but their second round matchup was an absolute dogfight. I mean, neither team shot well from the field. The two teams shot a combined 31.1% from the field. Yikes. But the Irish shot at 34% compared to Mississippi State's 29%, and that was enough to get the win in front of a rowdy crowd inside Purcell. Ivy took a page out of the Mike Bray playbook and used a six-player rotation throughout, including two freshmen in KK Bransford and Cassandra Prosper off the bench, but it was the senior Lauren Ebo who put the team on her back and carried the Irish to victory. She finished with 10 points, 18 boards, and five blocks. Those 18 rebounds, that set the school record for the most rebounds in an NCAA tournament game. She broke Katrina Gaither's mark of 16 set in 1997. Ebo also did it on the defensive end, too, holding the Bulldogs' leading scorer, Jessica Carter, to five points on two of 11 shooting. She, uh... She was just awesome. She was everywhere on the court and really just carried the Irish to a victory there. But give credit to the Bulldogs, see, they had the Irish on the ropes after opening the fourth quarter on an 8-0 run to tie the game at 41. Ebo put the Irish back in front with a putback to push the score to 43-41 with 40, 38 left in the game. And the Irish were able to finish strong down the stretch to get the win in advance to the Sweet 16. If you haven't been following this team all season, I'd highly encourage you to jump in, jump on the bandwagon now. Neil Ivey's team is incredibly resilient. They're down two of their best players in Olivia Miles and Dara Mabry, who are both out with knee injuries, but they just keep finding a way to win, and they'll square off against the Maryland Terrapins next weekend in the Sweet 16. Also want to give a shout-out to the Fighting Irish baseball team, who picked up a big win over fourth-ranked Wake Forest on Sunday. Wake Forest was 14-0 at home so far this season until Notre Dame took Game 3 of the weekend series by a final score of 3-1. Remember Jack Finley? 
you know, the hero from Notre Dame's run in the college baseball World Series last season? The sophomore lefty usually comes out of the bullpen, but he started on Sunday and absolutely shoved. Finley finished with 10 strikeouts across five and two-thirds innings and allowed just two hits, just an absolutely dominant performance out of the lefty. It's been a tough start to Sean Siffler's first season as head coach since he replaced Link Jarrett, who left to return to Florida State, his alma mater. The Irish are now 9-8 on the season and 2-3 and in conference play as they head into their home opener on Tuesday night against Valpo. Hopefully the opportunity to return home after a big win like this is what the Irish needed to turn things around. And uh, one final shout-out before we get out of here. I want to give a shout-out to the entire Notre Dame football recruiting department. They had their Pot of Gold campaign on Friday, St. Patrick's Day. We've seen it uh, for a few years now, and this year was another major success. I thought the videos they put out there were uh, they were awesome. If you haven't seen them yet, go check them out. I think Marcus Freeman tweeted out, and a bunch of others did as well. It was like a play on the House of Dragon title sequence. It was so cool. And shout out to whoever edited that, man. That was that was really impressive work. I was blown away. And I talked to Kevin Sinclair from Irish Illustrated before this, and he said that by his count on Notre Dame's Pot of Gold Day, Notre Dame offered a total of 66 high school players on Friday. Most of them were in the class of 2025, but there were some 2024 prospects mixed in there as well. And to put out a campaign like that, on that big of a scale where it's cool, it's unique, it's different, but it also makes sense with sort of the ethos of Notre Dame, the Irish, and all that really, really great stuff. And that takes a ton of work from everyone involved. And we know in recruiting, these these recruits are getting a ton of attention from a ton of different schools. So being able to do something different, do something that's unique, doing something that's specific to the school is really hard to pull off sometimes. But Notre Dame was able to do that. They continue to find new ways to separate themselves in ways like this. So just on the way out, shout out to everyone who is a part of that. I loved it. That's going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. On the way out, remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts and give us a follow on Twitter at Lockdown Irish, on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account at Tyler Wojcik. That's at Tyler, W O J C I A K. For a second, listen, check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, where experts Isaac Shade and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court, plus hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. That's Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. I'll see you guys tomorrow.